so it looks like the music is turned off, so that's a sign for me to begin. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to uh, Wednesday of Build, the last day. Good to see you all still around and joining my session. I'm going to talk about reducing third-party security risk in .NET Core applications, a long sentence, um, but that's the thing that I'm going to cover within the next 60 minutes. First, uh, a brief introduction with a really, really large picture, as you can see. So who am I? I'm Neil Stanis. I work as a security researcher for Vericode, and I got a background in .NET development and uh, application and security consultancy. So at Vericode, I combine those worlds into one, and I'm mostly focused on static analysis of .NET applications and help out finding the right things and help out customers doing a better job. If you want to talk about it, come see me afterwards, because today's topic is going to be reducing third-party security risk in .NET Core applications. So, as you all might have known, if you start out developing an application and you say in your console .NET new and you start with an MVC, then once you start building it, the first thing it will do, it will do a .NET restore and it will go to a package manager like Microsoft's NuGet and it will fetch all the dependencies it needs in order to get the application together and in order to run it, right? First question I would always ask like, okay, all these projects, how do they deal with security and aren't there any problems inside of it? Of course, when you're developing, you need to have some sense of what the libraries are doing for you, right? You need to have to know some, some idea of the intent of the library. You need to use it in the right way, like not use it um, in a way that the developer itself hasn't intended it to be used, right? Which might result in problems. And of course, you need to make sure that you got the latest version because there might be a security patch out um, because something happened and there was a fix for it. And if you're not updating your components, then there's a risk, of course, right? So, all of this combined, if you do this, will this be sufficient to um, deal with third-party risk or deal with security problems? I think there's, there's some room for improvement. Um, consider the fact that what we have seen lately in the news is that um, packages also are compromised, right? And people with bad intent do extra stuff with the packages and maybe add some malicious things that do stuff that you don't want to, right? So, there's a lot more, and in this session, I'm going to talk you through some of the risks that I just identified, give you some examples of what that is and what you would think, like, what would help out and what, what doesn't help, help out in that situation. And the last bits would be, um, we're going to move to an, an app, we're going to do some code changes, because I want to focus on doing stuff in .NET Core itself and reducing the risks of library that we're using. And at the end, we're going to move to uh, reviewing components, right? So that's the takeaway that will be the, the storyline supported by this agenda. Risks, then I'm gonna to move to um, a demo app that I created. Of course, there's a package used in that demo app that has some problems inside of it. We need to know um, what's happening. We need to know what type of things we need to take care of by changing our application. That's what we're gonna focus on. We're gonna do that by compartmentalizing or isolating the pieces of logic inside the app itself. And then, the last bit of the presentation, I'm going to move to uh, an easy way of reviewing APIs and libraries and to identify security problems. Then there will be a conclusion at the end, there will be Q&A. So, let's see how it goes. So, third-party risks in general, as I already said, you build on top of dependencies, right? That's how we develop nowadays. And it's nice because it helps us out being more productive. People have solved problems that we don't need to solve anymore. I think that, that, that can be a big plus. And as I already also said, it's, it's important to know what the intent of a library is, right? If you're doing image processing in some kind of library that you're using in your application, it doesn't make sense if it does a request to an external source, let's say like a web address to fetch data, right? If it, that happens inside that library, then there's something is going on. You need to maybe dig into it a bit further. Third bit would be like, what do these projects do for security? And what I mean by that is like, most of the open source things that are built by people are done in their spare time. They have a job, they will do that because, like on a sidetrack, because they like to do it, like to help out, they like to share what they've done already, which of course is a big plus for everybody. But fixing stuff takes time, right? And, and yeah, it's, 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 a bit of a, it's a bit of a skew if you would compare it to a big organization that, that, that produces software and that has a full big team that focuses on application security and that helps out the developers doing uh, a better job, right? Of course, also, if we're developing apps, 
we probably have a security development lifecycle, or at least I hope you have something inside your development process that helps you out defining the security things you need to meet. It's important that you analyze your, the, your solutions for dependencies that might have vulnerabilities, right? There are commercial products that do it. Pericode, of course, does it. There's a lot of others that can do exactly the same. But it's important that you keep your, your, your libraries up to date, right? And the last bullet in this piece is also be aware of the fact that you might want to use a single library that you get from NuGet, but there might be a whole uh, tran a transitive list underneath it, right? The whole tree of extra dependencies you will get for free because you're using that one. And that's just the dependencies it brings. So if you think like I'm adding one single thing, then usually it's a bit more. So throwing in some metrics, um, this is a report that we produce once a year. And it, um, it contains some of the statistics of the applications that we have analyzed. And in the edition of last year, um, it turned out that almost 86% of the .NET applications that we analyze have at least one vulnerability or one vulnerable component inside of it. Java, it's almost 88, and C++, it's uh, uh, 92, right? So it's, it's quite significant. If you want to see the report, you can, you can go to the link. So if there is a component inside your application which is vulnerable to something, what's, what's the worst that might, that might happen? I think this is one you probably are familiar with over here, the Equifax data breach. It was solely based on the fact that the Struts component, which was on the server, was outdated. And in a time window of two months, I believe, the fix was done in March. And between March and May, Equifax got hacked, and they stole a lot of data, right? 140 million plus records were stolen. So small time window, right? And keep in mind, like, fixing stuff, having the package, being used by everybody, that takes time. And two months is not that long, of course. So this happens if the if, if, uh, dependency is not updated. What's another security risk that we need to be aware of? And this one was in the week, uh, news last week also in a wide article, article which was uh, about supply chain attacks, right? So instead of focusing on hacking apps, people are more focused on hacking the supply chain, right? We are building a DevOps world in which we have infrastructure as code and we have build pipelines that produce the artifacts that makes up our software. And people will move to that part, like that's also as valuable as the application itself, right? The targeted attacks will point to that direction. And people will, like with bad intentions, might do funny things with, with, uh, with the libraries itself. Keep in mind that your own supply chain is inherently tied to the ones of the components that you're using, right? So if one of those is, is compromised, then that inherently means that you are also in trouble, right? So there is a, a, a really tight relationship to that. And what's one example um, of this instance uh, that happened November of last year, or at least it was published in November of last year, which was an NPM package called EventStream. Turned out that somebody um, joined the team and it was a still project, there was not much done on it. And eventually he participated, did some work, and everybody was happy, and then he got ownership of it. And then I think in the time that went on, he decided to add some additional functionality to the library, which was targeting a specific Bitcoin wallet and to steal everything that's inside of it, right? So in order of perspective, 200, 2 million downloads a week. And the reason why that happened is that this is a package that is a transcendent dependencies, a dependency of 2,000, I believe 2,000 other ones, right? So you can probably see why this is, uh, uh, can be really good for an attacker if you want to hit a lot of systems, right? You target the library that's widely used, make up your social plan, and then it's still a person that might be able to get this, right? Supply chain attacks, then we can say like, yeah, but if we sign packages, then we're probably good. And then of course the answer would be no. Phil Hack had a nice article a couple, I think a month ago in April, according to the URL, um, in which he explained like, hey, how NuGet signing works, and it's, yeah, it's not everybody signs, it's hard, certificates are expensive, there's a lot more other things. And he gave other alternatives, how you can trust NuGet owners and their packages, right, which is a good alternative. But keep in mind that if a supply chain is attacked, then how does this signing help you out, right? And Another good example was one that happened in March of this year, or at least that like, was published in March of this year. And some people from Kaspersky um, published that the Asus update software, which was installed on laptops, had a supply chain attack. 
And the packages that they delivered were fully signed, were, there was nothing wrong with it. And the only way that you could figure out something was wrong is to look at the internals and to see like there's a piece of code that has malicious behavior inside of it. Funny fact about this one is that uh, they say like it's one million, million infections. Turned out there were like 600 uh, hardware, hardware addresses embedded in that malware which were targeted, right? So it was really something specific. So you're probably wondering, at least I'm wondering like who wants to do something like that. So it's a really targeted attack that was done based on this. And it was hard to um, distinguish because everything was just right if you looked at the packages that were produced. So enough, enough said. Um, some of the risks, and let's now move to the demo app that will be the subject of, uh, of this presentation. Now I'm gonna do the first thing that might go wrong, which is the switch, going to number seven. And yes, that's good. So first, I, I got a project, which is just an ordinary MVC project. And um, you probably are aware of, um, of the command, which you can allow you to, to show all the, the packages that are inside this thing, right? What we see over here is that th these are the top level packages. There's one, the first one, awesome PDF. That's, of course, the library that will be our, the, 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 the thing that we're gonna talk about. But these are just the top level packages, right? If you say, I would like to see the transitive ones, you will see the list already scrolls out, but there's a lot more in that, right? And awesome PDF um, is a library which is pretty small but it uses one which will be the one that we're gonna focus on, which is iText7 or iText Sharp, right? That's a, a C Sharp library that you can use in order to create PDF things. But if we scroll down, we also see that there's, uh, there's Bounty Castle included for some crypto, there's some common logging, and these are, of course, all the things you get if you create a new MVC app, right? So keep in mind, there's a lot more. By just adding a single package, there's a lot more underneath you need to take care of. So let's start out the app and let's see what it is. So the app is called Favorite Places and I needed to come up with a demo. So I'm, um, I'm traveling now and then to different cities and this is like a social thing that you can write down the stuff that you've experienced in that city and the stuff, stuff that you like about this. So it's just a regular app. You can do the, the editing, right? It's not nothing fancy. I'm no UI designer, default template, just work with that. And there's one thing which you can do, which is generating a report, right? So if you click on it, this is a PDF. It has a picture which talks about Amersfoort. That's the place where I'm living right now. And there's some text underneath it, right? And there are more cities in this list. And there's one that needs a special mention because at the bottom you will see a place called Middermeer. And you will say like, hey, Niels, what's Middermeer? But let me generate a report for that. So first 20 years of my life, I grew up in Middermeer. And if you just go outside the city, then this is the site you will see. And next time, if you create an instance in Azure West Europe, then that's the location you're using, right? So that's the, the, the first part of my life. And 20 years, I've lived there. And right now, there's like West Europe, one of the biggest data centers of Azure over there. So pretty cool stuff. So what are the problems that this library has? First of all, it generates a PDF. Turns out, I'm just going to explain it to you, what happens. Turns out that the name which we can type in here, is used in order to construct a file path, right? So what would that result in? That's something we call a path reversal or path problem. So if I say dot, dot, slash Amersfoort, this will probably be a PDF that's written a directory higher than it's supposed to be written down to. If I do this, because that's the folder of the app itself, the WW root, and we say this is build 2019, and save it. If I now generate the report, then you will see that the name is a bit weird. But if I then open up this one, you will see that that's exactly the same. So it turns out that based on that input that has been given, right now I'm typing it, but imagine that this is a community-driven thing and everybody can just share information with each other. You have a path traversal issue, which is useful. I won't recap what we'll be able after, after this. Second problem lies in the fact that it uses an image. So as you see over here, there's a path which looks like it's pointing to a folder, which in this case is a folder with, with pictures inside of it, right? So you also see that Midamir is still part of it, exactly the same. So that's just a folder, so that's a local file path. What if I change this and put in this URL? 
which I can show you. So this is a picture on the internet, which is belonging to the tourist office in Amersfoort, which shows you the nice square with all the cafes. If I put that one in and save it, and then generate the report, we will see that it will take a bit longer, but the report is generated with the picture inside of it. So what's the issue here? The, the, um, the, the, the name for this is something we call a server-side request forgery, meaning that you're able to manipulate a request that's done by the application itself, and it can go to an external resource, and you can probably do a lot of things with it. I'm gonna get more into the details on that, right? So this is the app. If we then look, a quickly, quickly peek into the code, what it is, it's just a single controller, and there's one method that we're gonna focus on, which is the report method, and what does it do? It generates a PDF, so it instantiates a component. There's one argument, which is uh, the first argument in the constructor of this, which has the name of output folder, right? So probably there's something with that path reversal thing. We can generate it, and then it will give back the content, the file, it will open up the file, and it will render back the content. So that's what, what's happening in this case. Switching back. So, recap of the security vulnerabilities we've seen. So the path reversal means that somebody can manipulate a path, and that's done inside the library, right? We cannot control it, we cannot change it, and that's what we're gonna figure out in the next part of the presentation. So, we have the ability to write files in any arbitrary location, and right now it also ends the extension of PDF, but there might be some situations where you can truncate file names or folder names if you exceed max lengths, and there are some possibilities to write files with different names. Still, the component itself generates a PDF, right? So, if you want to generate something else, that will be hard, um, but you can overwrite files. The second one we saw, is the server-side request forgery, and I want to spend a bit more time on this one. So, it's the ability for an attacker to, to, to manipulate a parameter that's used to do a request. And usually those type of vulnerabilities are used to do information disclosure. So if you can probably see, like, I'm not typing in a URL, but if I would say, like, I'm doing a file handler and I'm opening up this file, depending on the type of API you're using in C-sharp, it might open that file, and it will give you back the results if that's the way how that request is done. It can also access local servers, right? So if this web thing is running inside of a, a, a hosted environment or it's running inside of Azure, then you can probably do the same with saying like, hey, I would like to grab the response of localhost on port 3306 and see if there's a MySQL server running or not. And the last URL on this slide, you probably recognize if you're running on Azure, it's the metadata service from Azure. And if you would have put that one in, you might get data back. Luckily, Azure has, I think they thought about it because you need to add an additional header to that request in order to get that data back. So if somebody's able to do this inside your application, then that metadata is not accessible unless he also has control over the header. He or she has control over the header. So other cloud vendors do have this issue. You can just issue a request and you will get the metadata back in exactly the same. Keep in mind that these types of things like look pretty harmless, but they usually are a stepping stone for somebody to do a lot more inside your app. And if you go to the URL I put down over here, there are write-ups of bug bounties, and if you look for the acronym of, of server-side request forgery, you will find nice stories of people explaining how they used it and how they eventually got remote code execution and how they made money out of it, right? Because that's the whole purpose of um, bug bounties. In our case, we're dealing with something we call a blind variant because the output that we like, request at that point is not something that's directly given back to us, right? It's part of that image that's loaded inside the PDF. The only thing that we can do is, of course, keep an eye on how long it takes to execute, right? And in this case, blind timing things, a port which is open will probably respond quicker if we look at a local host URL than a port that's closed, right? Or, or the opposite way. At least with timing, you're able to have some distinct and it can be used as a side channel. So, a lot of possibilities, and what I want to do right now is see if there might be ways for us to isolate this functionality within the application itself, right? So maybe we're able to do some kind of sandboxing and put the PDF logic inside of that and then execute it in a more controlled way. 
and it would be even better if it's a sandbox that we can limit capabilities, right? So uh, maybe we uh, uh, like take out stuff and then, and then see what happens. So if we talk about this in the .NET world, you probably say like, hey, Niels, there is one piece that probably is able, or like that, that should be able to help us out. If we look at app domain, and if we look at the definition, it's, it's been defined as something that can be used as an isolation boundary for security, reliability, versioning, and loading and unloading of assemblies, right? So yeah, that sounds, sounds pretty good. And if we look at some of the examples we have seen in the past, like if you start out an app, you get one single app domain, you can create a second one inside of it and say like this one has least privilege or at least like has less privileges because I say like you need to run the context as if this data comes from the internet, right? That's the um, um, code access security helps you out in, in locking down the APIs. And I'm not gonna talk about code access security, I'm not gonna talk through all those details because it was quite complex and um, the, it, it will be a long story. Aside from that, I think one example really speaks out and you probably have seen it, which is something we call medium trust and ASP.NET. So at some point, I think it was 3.5 or 4.0 ASP.NET, you were able to configure the web config to say like, hey, this application runs a medium trust. And what that would mean is that your app would have less APIs available or your, like if you would have uh, run this in a, a hosted environment, so there was a um, shared hosting, which we had at that point, and single process was responsible for doing all the .NET stuff. Now with medium trust, you were unable to get access to the registry throughout the APIs. You're not able to get all the temporary files on the system, right? That was being locked down because uh, you got a security exception once you try that. So as from 2017, Microsoft advised, if you go on docs.microsoft.com, that you should not use code access security as a security boundary. So that's a bit unfortunate. And the other thing, which was the last dot on the slide, is that .NET Core doesn't support app domains, and it only has a single app domain once it starts a process, and that's it. We cannot create a second one and do the some things with it. So reading through this, I thought like, oh, what will be next? Luckily, there was an alternative. So one of the internals of app domain, a load context, was exposed. And that one has got APIs, which looks pretty promising for the thing that we want to achieve. Because our assembly load context can be used as a scope for loading, resolving, and potentially unloading, I think that's .NET Core 3.0, unloading assemblies. And um, the nice thing about it, it, it can be used to load, load multiple versions of assemblies inside the same process. And um, Nate McMaster, who is part of the ASP.NET team, um, wrote a nice library which allows you to do a plugin type of thing. And in his examples, you will see that he has got an MVC app that runs two controllers and one controller uses automap per version and the other one has a different one. So he has shown like, hey, this is a way that you can s uh, load something in a container and, and have it smaller and work with it from that way. Another aspect that we're gonna pull into this conversation is something we call self-contained deployments. So when you're publishing an app, you can also choose to target the platform and say like, it needs to be self-contained. And then the output of that folder will contain all the binaries for you in order to execute your application on that, on that platform. So in my case, it will be Mac OS X, so I'm targeting to a folder. I will have an executable inside that folder that will do everything and all the dependencies it needs. That's also one of the key things that we're interested in uh, working with uh, in this thing. So a lot of points, a lot of things I've said, what's better than moving to code and then see how it possibly can work. So switching back to number seven. I'm gonna load a different, different space. So what we want to do is we want to have an assembly load context that will take care of all the PDF stuff that we're doing. I think that's like the main goal. So the first bits that we need is we need to make sure that we're like isolating that functionality and the way that our host will talk to the plugin is usually based on an interface. So there is a project edit which has a single interface which just meets up the things that we've already seen, right? Just IPDF service, the naming, it's not the best choice maybe but fits the needs right now. It can generate a PDF if you have this interface. So 
What I've also done is there is a PDF library project that implements the interface, and that will have the instance of our library inside of it, right? So this is exactly the same. There are two statements which I'm going to use in my demo, so don't worry about those, but the ones at the bottom at 10 and 11, it's similar code as we have seen in our application, right? So this is a library project, and we're going to take this in a self-contained deployment, put it in a folder, and then use the plugin loader to do some things with it. If we then look at the, uh, the web project, the host, because we want to keep it into inside a single process and have a single, single thing, like don't do other stuff, we will see that, that the, remo the, 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 the only thing that we added is another component. So yes, I'm, I'm dealing with security in components and I'm adding another component, but uh, maybe Nate is around the, somewhere here still and we can ask him face to face if we can trust him or not. But um, and the other thing is of course the reference to the, the services library because we need to have the interface. And then all the magic happens inside the configure services and I'm gonna spend some time talking you through what I'm doing over here. So, we're gonna create a custom assembly load context, right, which will give us the PDF service. And first we're gonna um, do a create from assembly, as you've seen over here, so the PDF assembly contains the full path to the, the DLL, and that's the formula that has the self-contained my, my PDF library deployment inside of it. And we're gonna say the types that I want to share in this case is only the interface. The next thing would be get the types out of the assembly load context and say, um, I would like to have everything that's assignable for this interface and uh, give me the first of default. If that type is found, then we're gonna add that one to our services collection in our MVC app, right? So this should be sufficient for the plugin manager to create an instance of the PDF service or uh, which, which has the uh, PDF library inside of it, which does all the things for us. If we then take a look at the controller, of course, because we replaced that, you will see that the controller on its constructor gets the PDF service injected, right? That's the instance we saw earlier. And then if we go down to the report, then we will see like we've replaced this code with calling the interface, and we're doing exactly the same. So the first question is like, will this work? So as I said, we're gonna do um, self-contained deployments. So what I'm gonna do is I got two, um, two, uh, two build scripts that are shell scripts that will do all the things that I need to do. So it will do the publish. So first we're gonna take the host and it will do the self-contained deployment of this because there is a relation between the default assembly context you have in your main app and the way that the plugin loader works and otherwise it will fall back to shared locations and that's not what I want. I want to have full control over all the DLLs that get loaded because aside from the fact that code access security was able to block us from API usage, I want to maybe just take out types because I think that might be the, the, the way to fix this. We're gonna do the same with the library, right? So there's a build deploy in that same directory. So now there's a folder, co folder called published one level higher, I will start it, the app. Let me quickly do a attach to that process. This one, make sure we got a breakpoint. The report one that's there, yes, it is, cool. So, same app, we can still, run the report, right? We can see like we started out, this is the same controller method, this is the interface one. If we now go inside this method and trace into, we will see that it calls this. And I think one important key, okay, so what's the current location of the PDF DLL and where is it being loaded from? And as you, I'm hopefully, I'm hoping that everybody can, can read this, but it says like it's the published directory slash my PDF library, right? So that's the published folder we used. And then the second question would be like, hey, where is HTTP client type? Where is that coming from? And this is in the same folder, right? So it's self-contained and system.net.http contains the HTTP client. And 
Um, of course, the, the eye texture up, I've, I've reviewed it, so internally it uses that to get the picture. So we want to focus on that type. So having done this, what will be the next thing that we are able to do? As I said, I would like maybe to take out this piece of functionality and only allow people to use images which are local and not allow them to use an HTTP client. So maybe we can just move forward by saying, let's remove the DLL that delivers the HTTP client to the plugin. Let's see what happens. So system.net.http DLL, let's remove it. Let's go up one folder and let's start the application again, right? So this is the published host. We're gonna do the attach the same way. And let's see what it's doing. So, places. What happens if I now take this and let's change this one back. I want to put in the URL, which is external, right? So it fetches the image from the internet. If I now press report, the breakpoint hits. And then we see this missing method exception because it wants to do a get stream async on the HTTP client. So maybe by removing that DLL, we've achieved what we want, right? So we want people to still use files that are local to the system in their reports, and we don't want people to put in URLs. And yes, you can possibly also validate input. That's also important, but I want to take out that piece of that library that it's not usable anymore. So if we now want to do one based on a file, what will happen? We get the same exception. So it turns out that inside that uh, URL util in, in iText, there is a code pad that touches both the local files and the HTTP client. So removal of this client is not a possible way for us to fix this. Maybe we can put in a stub that helps us out. So let me quickly open up another solution, which is system.net, like the .http. And what I'm doing over here is I'm doing exactly what it wants, right? It wants to have a method, but the only thing I'm doing right now is like if you call get stream async, throw a not supported exception saying like, hey, you're not allowed to do this. So this one also has a magic deployment script because not I'm gonna copy and paste because that will only be resulting in errors. This one has put this DLL inside that my PDF library folder we saw earlier. So if we now go back to the console and restart favorite places, restart the app again, going back to the browser, let's delete this. So can we now report, generate a report which is using a file? So this is a local image file that is inside the folder, right? This is images slash boston.jpg. What about if I do the report based on the web request? Then it's uh, giving us a stack trace which says like, hey, this is not supported and I think that's exactly what we want to achieve, right? So with this whole getting rid of a DLL and replacing it, we were able to still use this library, get files loaded, the local files loaded, and uh, this allow way to do any external request just by taking out a single method. So let's just recap that and go back to the slides. So Storyline created a separate PDF library that, has a, that, that implements a shared interface, then we have taken the plugin loader of Nate that we used in order to create an instance that we put inside the DI container. Then we did a self-contained deployment of both the host application and the PDF library itself. And then we started out removing and replacing the HTTP client DLL itself. Is this something that we can work with? I think, um, it, I think it has potential if you're doing this and if you know like, hey, I'm, I'm even deploying a single app and I want to take out parts of the base class library it doesn't need, like why do you want to have it in? And one thing that has um, as a similar interest is something which they're working on, I think right now, which is the linker, the monolinker, which comes with .NET Core, right? 
So all the demos we have seen with 3.0, the Windows apps that were published were all big folders, a lot of files. And the linker should be able to cut out that code path and cut out the stuff that we don't need. And why not use it also to cut out the DLL or like to cut out the APIs that we don't want the libraries to use? I think that's something that might be workable. Still, there is a need if you're doing this to uh, make sure that, to, that your software behaves as expected, right? That you need to cover it, it's, that to do the test coverage to see that it works. But it has potential. An alternative might be a library called Harmony, which allows you to rewrite IL in memory. I would be more in favor of doing it um, with the IL linker and doing it inside the binaries, because doing it at the runtime might be uh, a bit more uh, prone to errors. Um, and I know that Harmony hasn't got full up to par with .NET Core, and I think they're waiting on some 3.0 bits to be released in order to continue. But it, ha it has potential. So keep in mind, this is a concept, right? So don't use this <laughs> in any way. I'm willing to work on this to make it even better, maybe to do the plugin library in a different way, that it's like that you can define stuff and you can take out stuff. It has a lot of potential. So seeing this solution, seeing this assembly load context, what would be an alternative that we can follow, right? And the next bits would be maybe take the PDF library and put it in a separate host or put it in a separate process, right? And lock down that process. I think that's the most logical thing if you look at this. I was trying real hard to keep it all in a single app. That's the first demo. But let's say you're able to just do a second process that has limited rights. You can still decide to cut out the HTTP client in the same way I've done before. But with the, the other process, you're able to maybe limit access right to folders, and also take care of the whole path reversal thing that's inside, right? So in my demo project, because um, um, the time is probably not sufficient enough to show this demo, but it's inside the GitHub project that we're gonna share at the end. And uh, you can see another improvement also because you don't want to have file paths being returned, you want to return the result itself. And then it doesn't matter what the PDF generation does internally with file names as long as it takes care of its own thing and gives you back the result, right? So fixing it in code, having a second process, which is pretty obvious, what will be something else that we can do? And of course, if we look at architectures and at softwares, I think um, the thing that has been happening, like when I started out developing with um, .NET 1.0, we created monoliths, then which we glued everything into one application. Right, and what we have seen over the years is that we got server orientation, and then we moved to microservices and serverless where we're at right now, and that was allowing you to create more small granular components that were doing the business that it needs. It scaled more easily, right? You can leverage cloud platforms like Azure. And why not use similar type of approaches also to isolate, in this case, these kinds of PDF servers that I have created, right? So yes, I know it, 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 it sounds obvious, but um, I think it's definitely good to be aware that your, your application needs to be um, as small as possible with the APIs it uses. And if it then also runs inside of, let's say, a Docker container on Kubernetes with a lockdown image and it has sufficient rights to do everything, it even hasn't that egress internet connection, right? It cannot make requests to the outside world. Then you're also solving a lot of problems. So moving on in this space, I think, um, that's the story that we can do. We can change our code, we can move to a different process, which is of course obvious, or like fit it in in one of the, the architectures that we're creating nowadays. And talked a lot about libraries and how you would be able to isolate. Um, next up will be like, I want to focus more on getting reviews done on libraries. And of course, um, you can always say like, yes, Niels, I can go to GitHub if the project is public. Get, download the source code or do a clone of the repo locally and go to review the source code. Um, honestly, I myself, I'm, I'm pretty lazy. I would like to do a bit more efficient thing. So that's the thing I want to uh, show you that there are different ways how you can do this with the help of some small tools. It's important to have still some knowledge of internals of how a library behaves and what it does and what you expect from that library, right? And the second distinction I would like to make, like the things that you've seen before is a single component that does that PDF generation, but we're also developing on top of frameworks, right? MVC is one example of it, which has a much more higher integration in the software that we write because 
yeah, it, the MVC app itself uh, uh, needs more and has more involvement in how your code executes, right? The last red, red sentence I did put in on purpose explicitly here because we're gonna do some decompilation of components and be aware that components have licenses and if you get one from NuGet, then it's not necessarily allowed that you decompile it and look in, inside this internal. So if you're planning on doing it, and, um, and after this talk, please make sure that you contact the right legal person to confirm that you're allowed to do it because I'm not aware of everything. So, review. First, a small sidestep. And a small sidestep, I mean I would like to do a call, small code snippet and to look at some intent of, of, uh, of a piece of code. So, question, what's this? Um, what we see over here, looks like a controller, right? And if I would ask like, does this thing have an issue, then the get file data method is part of the controller, it's public. It opens up a file, reads all the text inside and returns it as a result. So if, we, if you paid attention, this is probably a path traversal issue also, right? Because the input is used in opening a file if I then do the dot dot slash and traverse to other files, then there is an issue. But is this really a controller? And the question, of course, would be that depends on the context which it's executed in. So if this is part of an MVC project that has reference or a project that has reference with one of the MVC components, then it will do a, a convention-based resolving of controllers and everything that ends with the name controller will be found or will be exposed by default. Even libraries that you pull in from NuGet, if they have a reference with MVC, and if they have something inside which is called controller, it will be found and it will be exposed. The whole convention-based thing. It's nice, it helps out, but I would rather see it changed. And uh, last week, David Fowler tweeted about the fact that they want to do this as a compiler step. And I'm really curious what they're gonna change about this because if it ends up turning being a marker, a marker interface or a marker, or like a class inheritance type of thing, then it's still possible, right? But um, this is more like a sidestep from, so we have uh, a, a class, which supposedly looks like a, a controller, and it, and it all depends on the context. So this is more like a piece of intent, and you need to be aware of it, right? So moving on, I'm gonna go back to code, and we're gonna do some code reviewing. So let me switch to another project, which is called Fennec, as in the Desert Fox. And this is the thing that we're gonna talk about today. So this project takes the Mono CISO library, which is a library that can open up assemblies, .NET assemblies, and read the IL that's inside of it. And I thought like maybe I can create a tool which is like small and, and useful and that helps out dumping the stuff that's inside of that, that DLL. So what I'm doing is I'm iterating over all the modules of that library and I'm getting all the types out of it. And then for each of the method body that's inside of that, uh, of that class, I will say, okay, look at the instructions and see if there are any invocations just the, all the opcodes which start with call, or if there is a new object instantiation done. What I'm doing then is I'm constructing a string and that will consist of the class type and the method name, and you will see the example later on, with the parameters of that method itself, and the type code that's done inside it. It will just create a list, and it will do it of every type that's inside of it. So it's a, it's a, it's a global CI, or it's a, it's a global uh, CLI tool that you can use. And I've installed it in my machine already, and it's on NuGet. So what we can do is we can go to the PDF library directory and say, okay, uh, let's run the tool. And I would like to have the output written to a folder. And let's analyze awesome PDF. And let's take all the iText DLLs because I know that those are being used by that thing. So what it has done, it has created a list of files 
plain text files. And if we're gonna look into the details of that, and bear with me because if I'm opening up, there, there probably will be a lot of information. Don't try to interpret what you're seeing. But looking at the first line, and let me mark this, you will see a block of things like these files just contain a class name, a method name with signature of the method itself. So that's like the, the method inside that class body. And behind that, you will see all the invocations that are done, right? So inside that, that PDF generation, we see that uh, it creates a PDF document, it creates a PDF writer. We see that um, uh, there is an image factory used, so that's probably the image thing that we have seen, which we probably need to dig into a bit further. But imagine that you just run this tool with the output and do it on every library that you use, or like the libraries that you're like using and updating, you can easily do a diff on the file that you created of the previous version and the new one. And I've sorted it alphabetically, so it, it should be just fitting in, but you will have an easy side. You can easily see like, hey, this has changed, and why does this method now uh, use a HTTP client? Why does it instantiate uh, a binary formatter? Why does it use Newton soft? And then it sets it type and handling to something else, right? Those are all risky things to do, and by just using these text files, you might be able to get a hold of them much easier. And the other thing, if I then take, and let's say I'm gonna search for HTTP client, you will see the answer of the things that we have um, been focusing on, the first part of the presentation. So there's a method over here, and that's the URL you two probably recognize from the stack trace. So this exactly mimics the behavior we have just changed, right? So it seems that there is a check on a path saying like, is this a local file or not? Otherwise, open a file stream, get back the results, or construct an HTTP client, that's the thing that we've taken care of, and do the get stream async on that, right? So this allows you to quickly take a peek. You could maybe review stuff. I think another one would be like once you have identified something that needs attention, like why not maybe create a Rosalind analyzer and then share it with everybody else in the project saying like, hey, if you're using this API, be aware of that second argument because that one is gonna be used in a path eventually for generating a file. And yes, we cannot change it right now, so make sure that you've, you do the right things before that data is being executed right inside that function. So I think there's a lot of um, things that might be, um, be helpful in that particular case. Same counts for using this on your first body code. You can also run this tool and just get uh, all the calls to a specific library out of it and then realize, and then just dig into it. And because it's a single string, it's easy readable. You can just see that. And you can also connect one dot with the other in another file by doing some simple text searching. So it's, it's just like API skimming throughout DLLs. And I think it might be helpful if you're able to do it and, and work from that. So moving on, um, a recap of the review, right? So as you've already seen, it was a pretty minimal implementation itself, the PDF generation. Uh, that's a component you probably won't find on NuGap because I <laughs> created it for this purpose. But it uses the iText7 library, right? That we were able to have more control over how it behaves by taking out those types. And we were able to um, identify saying like, hey, if we have a separate process, then we have more control over where the files are being written, and therefore also that risk will be reduced. And we saw that there were like two different spots. There was even a random access something inside of it, which also uses the same type of construct by saying like, hey, if it's a URL, go fetch it. If not, then we should uh, um, do it locally and fetch that file. So all of this is captured inside of a tool and as I said, it's called Fennec. It even has got a logo and stickers. So you can find it on this URL. It will redirect you to the NuGet, uh, to the GitHub re repo. Um, it can be used to, as I said, to do the diffs between uh, the, the DLLs and, and see what the differences are internally pretty quick. And um, some future plans, like what, what we're able to change, 
you probably imagine that if you're doing a more structured way of data, and if you uh, render, let's say, JSON data out of this instead of a text file, then you can load that inside of a document database, let's say Azure uh, Cosmos DB, and then take Gremlin APIs to do queries and to do recursive queries and to connect dots, and then you can have code paths being identified inside those libraries pretty easily. And as I said, like, yes, review source code is possible, but if this is automated, then as I said, like, I'm lazy. If you can automate it, then do it, right? And the same counts for the output that the tool creates. If you can maybe have other analyzers helping the developers out making better decisions, then that's the spot where those things need to be fixed. And you don't want them to pop up later on if you're doing, let's say, a pen test or even if you're doing just normal static analysis, right? If somebody can fix it already when it writes it, then that's a big win. So moving on. And um, wrapping up with a conclusion, at least the things that um, I would like you to take away from this talk is that I would encourage everybody to um, start reviewing components in a way or like in a way that works for you, but make sure that you have some ideas of, it, of its internals and what you expect from that component. Start using the tool that I shared and also uh, be aware of that you can isolate functionality by making better choices, right? And if you want to take the code route, then you should work on having that assembly load context maybe inside of a package that everybody can use. But there are ways that we can improve and reduce the risk. And the last one is a bit of an open door. I can see that because um, you need to integrate security. And what I mean by that is that this is just a small portion, right? If somebody develops software and can make better choices, then stuff is fixed. You still have, hopefully, depending on the organization you work in, a process that will take care of the security that involves static analysis, that involves component analysis by checking it for versions, maybe some pen testing. And also, let's say, if we look at architectures, like trap modeling is as important because you can smash in every security countermeasure you can find in, let's say, Azure, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be a more secure system because it might even work counter and work in the opposite direction. So, that's the takeaways I want you to, uh, to think about. And I'm going to say uh, wrap up. And I would like to thank you, everybody, for your attention. And last, I hope you enjoy the party tonight. I know I will. And um, if you want to find the code snippets, they will uh, be on my GitHub, or they're on it right now. And you can reach out to me or stick around for the next half an hour. I will be here to answer your questions. And if there are any questions, I think you can just walk up to the mic and it will probably be open for audio and you can shout out to me.